All right, guys, welcome back to the channel again. We are still working on this O2 ZR600 EFI. Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a track on this. We're gonna put a new track. We have a composite. It's obviously 121 inches long, it's 15 inches wide, and it is a one and a quarter inch paddle. It's a talent, it's a T320 track. So we're gonna go ahead and get this old studded, junky old track off here. And we're gonna go ahead and put this new track on. So we're gonna go ahead and show you the steps on taking it off and put it back on. So stay tuned. All right, so the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is go ahead and open the hood. And we need to get this exhaust off, okay? Because we need to get to the chain case down here. You got two on the pipe here that go into the silencer. And then there are three that go into the exhaust manifold. So what I use is just a pair of long needle nose that are hooked like this. Um, this is actually, this is a spring tool that I got from our trampoline setup and it's used to install springs. You could use something like this, really anything. There are special tools used that are kind of like this, but they're a lot longer and stronger, I believe. So either way, you can use any, any type of tool like that. And when I take these off, what I like to do is you can take them off from either side, but if you take it off from the far side and then you accidentally let it go, it has a tendency to shoot back towards the engine and then it can fall down in this area and then it's just a pain in the butt to try and fish them things out if you need to. So I like to pull them off on the side of the engine so that way if I accidentally let them go or they slip, then it shoots back towards the front of the sled. that one and then this will pop right off next step is to go ahead and remove your silencer here so there's two springs here and then a bolt on this side so you get your two springs just pop both of those off and then this bolt right here and then this whole assembly will pop right out obviously it's going to be a little different depending on the snowmobile that you're working on Seven sixteenths. Then the whole assembly comes off. All right, so now that we got the exhaust off, we're on the other side of the sled and the clutch side. Gonna go ahead and pop the belt cover open. You want to lock your parking brake and take the belt off. And what I do is I push in and twist. Just like that. Now that the belt is off, you can go ahead and remove your secondary clutch or your driven clutch. It's going to be a half inch socket, cap screw, cap bolt, whatever you want to call it. You'll want to account for the space that's in there as well. All right, when you're taking your driven clutch off, you can see that the Woodruff key is on the shaft still. So I like to make sure that I hold it back and kind of draw it back as I'm pulling forward on the clutch. And it just pops up and off. You can just leave that on there or you can take it off and put it aside along with the clutch. All right, so now that we have both sides clear to access the drive axle, to be able to take that out and replace the actual track itself, the next thing you need to do is go ahead and prop this up in a way that will be stable and will have free and clear access to everything under this side of the sled. All right, next step, once we have the sled up in the air and secured, we're gonna go ahead and pop these caps off on both sides of the axle. Once that is done, we want to go ahead and unlock the axle. And so we need to break loose both of these 9 sixteenths on either side of the rear axle. Personally, I like to use a couple of ratchets because using a wrench on one side doesn't really fit very well. 
The next step is to go ahead and loosen up the lock nut for the track tension bolts. That's just a 9 16 as well. If yours is rusty, you may need to put some PB Blaster on there and work it back and forth. Another good tip is to clean up the threads before you start moving this lock nut. So we'll do this on both sides. Once that lock nut is loosened up, you should be able to start backing the tension bolt off. You just wanna back it off all the way on both sides. When the trap, when this axle stops moving, that means it's bottomed out all the way forward. All right, so now that that's done, the next step is to remove the four mounting bolts for the skid itself. You got one in the footwell and then one below the seat, both sides. Okay, so depending on how loose everything is, you might actually just be able to zip these out with an impact wrench, or I'm sorry, an impact gun. Um, but if not, there's a 17, you need to slip a 17 millimeter thin wrench if you can onto the nut on the back side, on the inside of the, the TSL link. And then on the front bolts, there's actually a nut on the very inside, also 9 16 So we'll do both of these back ones first. All right, so that one came out without problems. All right, so this one's spinning. So the easiest way to hit it is coming in through the front. Okay, now on these front ones, you're gonna wanna get the 9 16 inch wrench back in on the back side to hold that. All right, that's the last bolt. The skid fell down and is ready to be removed. Okay, so what I do to prepare to remove this, the skid itself is I like to take a hook and try and hang up the track to get it up out of the way. It makes it seems to make it a little bit easier when getting the skid out. So now that the skid is out, we're going to go ahead and proceed into removing the chain case and the speedo here, and that will allow us to get to the bearings in the drive shaft to remove those. So once we get done with that, we'll be able to get the drive shaft out and then go ahead and pull the old track out, position the new one in, and then start reassembly. All right, so the next step is to go ahead and remove the drain plug. Now, if your sled is cold, a tip that I can give you to help get the most oil out of there is to go ahead and just take a little handheld torch and warm up the case cover and on the sides of the chain case and, you know, heat it up till it's nice and warm. You know, you can just, it only takes a minute or two. Um, just be careful that you don't melt anything. You don't want to burn the, the finish off or anything like that. Just keep it moving around and around. It'll warm up enough to where you should get better drainage. It is a little tight to get to, but... You know what? It's just the way it is. I want to make sure you got a nice good sized pan underneath to catch the draining oil. A ratcheting wrench would be the way to go for this. There it 
goes. Make sure you account for the O-ring. If it looks that bad, you might want to replace it. Okay, so I went ahead and put a new O-ring on this. Just gonna clean up this area here. Make sure you don't have any dirt in the hole, around in the hole there. Same thing with your plug. Ratcheting wrench. You just want to snug it up. Okay, here we are at the chain case. There are six bolts that hold the chain case cover on. There's a gasket. It's like an O-ring. So we have two at the bottom, two in the middle, and two at the top. And they're half inch. One thing I'd like to recommend is go ahead and putting plenty of shop tiles down underneath just to limit your mess. All right, so we got all six bolts out. This should just come right off. And there you go. It's the only bit of oil that was in there. So you go ahead and set that off to the side. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and get this lower sprocket off. Now, I did go ahead and lock the brakes already. So you should be able to just pop this off right here. Um, you'll need to pull both of these cotter pins. Well, one of them, really. You can just pull one side and then it'll dangle down. Um, you'll want to note the tension on the chain here. You'll also want to inspect the chain for any breaks in the linkages. Um, this looks like it's been pretty well taken care of, so there shouldn't be anything wrong with it. So we'll go ahead and uh, start that process. Go ahead and leave those on there and then we'll take our cotter pin and stick it back through there just like that all right so now that's done we can go ahead and loosen up this nut first and get that going before you try and loosen up the chain i believe that's a three quarter Set both the nut and washer off to the side. Now we can go ahead and loosen up. I mean, if you can get it off without loosening it up, why not? It might be kind of a pain putting it back on though. We'll see. All right. So go ahead and uh, set this bottom gear off to the side, noting that this space spacer edge that sticks out that was actually facing in you can see where the washer was putting its mark on this side of the gear go ahead and pop the chain off this would be a good time to inspect it make sure there's no uh, broken links here We're looking pretty good, so. Another thing you'll want to inspect 
as if well, we do have a couple broken ones here on the outside. That's not terrible though. Definitely something to keep an eye on every year when you change your oil. Right there. So on the outside, it's not too bad. But either way, you'll want to keep an eye on that. You might want to end up replacing it sooner or later. But another thing you'll also want to inspect are the teeth on the gears. Um, you don't want the teeth to have sharp tops to them. They're about, they're, they should be um, flat on the top. So you'll have an angle that goes up, over, and then down. It kind of looks like an A that's chopped off at the top. So you want to make sure that your gears look good. You're not missing any. There's nothing chipped. Okay, so this is the flange that holds this side's bearing in. So what we're going to want to do is just remove those three lock nuts and put those off to the side so we have access to remove the bearing. The bearing's not held in by anything else. Take those three nuts, they're half inch. Half inch nuts, but they're on 5 16 thread. And then this should pop right out. Simple as that. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and move to the other side. All right, so now we're on the clutch side here. And the first thing we need to do I like to clean off as much junk as I can. That's my first step every time. Clean, clean, clean. All right, so I'm going to take a brush. Get as much junk off as you can, whatever's there. Go ahead and take a pair of pliers and loosen up this speedometer cable. Go ahead and inspect the end of that. Make sure it's or it's nice and uh, square and there's no twists in it. Shouldn't be on this end. Typically, it's going to be on the inside here, which I'll show you in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and clean this off a little further, though. It's going to clean off this whole area around it just to get all the dirt and grime at all be a lot easier to deal with when you're taking it off you don't have to worry about a lot of junk getting in or any junk really if you clean it right getting onto the inside of the speedometer and whatnot i'm sorry the speedo gear go ahead and blow that out with air if you got it These are half inches as well. Now, 
on the back, these actually are carriage bolts that go through the tunnel. So you get to put them through the double flange system that holds the, the bearing to the tunnel. Okay, we just go ahead and pop this off. Yuck. That is some nasty looking grease there, folks. So, there's a couple pieces here. It's a little square rod. And it locks into a little port in here, a little square hole, and then a little square hole in here. And uh, what'll happen, that's the only thing that connects your drive shaft for the axle down there for the track to this sp speedo gear that's the only thing that connects it that's travels all the way then it spins this gear in here it's just a 90 degree gearbox and then spins that little speedo cable that i unscrewed out of this end and that's locked in by a square port as little square hole as well so we'll set this off to the side we'll get this cleaned up as well before we reassemble but we're going to go ahead and pull this out now, what will happen a lot of times is these will get water in them, they lock up, and then this piece ends up twisting in half. And you'll find half of it in here, half of it in the end of the shaft. As long as it's not rusted in there, it's typically pretty easy. It just pulls right out. Sometimes they are rusted in there. You got to, you know, grab them and just yank them suckers out. It's the only thing you can do is try and dig it out. And if you can't, then pretty much... If you want to make sure that you're not getting any water in here, folks. Okay, before we go and attempt to remove the axle itself, because it will come out and might even fall out right now. I'm screwing around with this. I'm going to go ahead and wipe all this clean. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, try and see if we can pop these bolts out real quick. They should just tap right out. You can see that bearing slipping back. So you'll now we're gonna go under the tunnel. All right, so at this point we should be able to push the axle that way. Because this end will fall out for the most part. There's one half of the flange down here. This is nasty up under here. Our bearing feels pretty good still. So we're in good shape. All right, I'm gonna go up there and grab that bearing off of the end of the shaft before I pull the shaft all the way out. All right, so you just want to lift the track and push it towards the front. And this thing will pull right out, just like that. Gather my parts here. You can see where this track's got some pullouts. Oh, looks like there's only two that I can see so far so but uh either way yeah it's definitely uh, an old track it's got a lot of use on it it's starting to get pullouts um you know when I f first started this thing up after rebuilding the top end and everything it uh oh there's another one down here as well over here so um, it ended up throwing a few pieces when I revved it up on the like third heat cycle. So that was the indication that it was time for a new track. All right, so let's go ahead and get this thing pulled out.
All right, so now that we got the track out of here, out of here, we can go ahead and clean this whole area up. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of junk up under here. So we just want to get the grime off. So we got a nice, clean, smooth surface because we're going to seal this up and make sure that no water gets in here. Okay, so now that we got these parts off, we're going to go ahead and start the cleaning process. Um, like I said, this stuff gets pretty nasty. And you know, it's, it's okay that it's this greasy. You'd rather it be, you know, nasty greasy like this than to be bone dry. Because then you know that this, you know, for one, if you're, if you're getting, if you are getting the sled, then you know someone was at least greasing it regularly. Or at least enough to cause this mess, that's for sure. So, we're going to get all this grease off. This is why I throw these in a bag. You use them like this, you know, just to clean whatever off. Don't just throw them away. It's wasteful. Just throw them in a bag, loose, ready to go. Still feels pretty good so just gonna go ahead and clean it off real well All right, so this is the track that we're putting on. Notice there are arrows. 
there is a direction that these are supposed to go on. So obviously when this goes around, these cups facing this way are gonna be facing this way when it's on the ground. And like I said, this is a composite 15 inch by 120 inch by one and a quarter inch lug. And it's the T320. This is actually the redesigned T32. So it's just mild differences in the lug pattern. Um, it's improved lug pattern for cornering. And that's where you get this kind of stuff. I see a lot of, tr a lot of tracks where they just have straight lugs across. And you know, when you're going around a corner, this is actually going to help push against any snow. And it's got a bunch of these everywhere. I, I love these tracks. This is my fourth. I have one on my 9070 XT, which is the T32. And then I have one on my ZR700. I have one on my ZR800 Cross Country. And now this one. Great tracks. I like them. Rather give my money to Russia than to China. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get this thing under and start prepping to get the axle back in and get this on the road. So All right, so the next step here is we're gonna go ahead and pre-pack this. All right, so the grease that I'm gonna be using today is uh, AMSOIL, synthetic water-resistant grease, marine power sports and trailers. Um, I've been using this stuff. It's got a low temp rating of, I believe it's either minus 40 or minus 60. This is definitely the kind of stuff you wanna use on snowmobiles. All right, so I got this pre-packed, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna set this off to the side because I'm gonna go ahead and put sealant around this as well before we put all this together. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go back over to the sled, and we're going to get this axle in place. Okay, so we're back onto the sled now. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and put some sealant around this hole here. And then once we do that, we're going to put a little bit of sealant around each of these carriage bolts to completely watertight this bearing inside. So we're gonna put the axle on the same way we took it out by inserting the drive side in through the chain case hole. I'm gonna go ahead and line up these holes. So I'm gonna put one bolt in to hold it up. Just put some sealant around this. A lot of people might think this is overkill, but this will make these bearings last a long time. It's kind of tricky getting them in at first, but this will completely seal out all water. And then I found just holding it between your two fingers Sometimes works. <laughs> so 
number two. And number three. All right, now we're gonna go put the Speedo gear on. Getting ready to put the Speedo gear on. And uh, once again, I already got this already cleaned up. I'm gonna go ahead and put sealant on this as well. Now, when you're putting this on, you wanna make sure that you don't knock the bolts in back into the uh, chain, or I'm sorry, the tunnel there. So, and make sure that you're covered all the way around. This out, These outside edges are the most important. All right, so I wanted to make sure that I got this little pin in here, which I didn't show you guys. Carefully thread each one on. And while you're threading these, it's a good idea to kind of pull out on them. That way the bolt doesn't slip back into the tunnel. I mean, there's a pretty decent amount of weight on it, enough to hold them in place. But every little bit of caution to avoid pain in the butt. is worth it. So a lot of the times when you go to put these back on, that square hole for that pin that links the drive axle to the speedo gear won't line up. So you just have to twist. The best way to do it is just to put the axle in there and then when you, before you put the speedo gear on, stick that pin in there and note the orientation and then pull it out, put it inside the speedo gear and twist it to where you think that it should be and then you can line it up. Got all three on. These get torqued to, I think it's 13 to 18, or 13 to 16 foot pounds. Gonna go ahead and put this back on while we're here. You could just give that a good crank. I don't know what they were thinking here. Now if you want, while you're here, clean this off. Gel on here. And just spread it around. It's like butter. <laughs> and while you're over here, Driving clutch back on. This driven clutch bolt, I torqued to 23. All right, now we're back on the chain case side. Okay. 
So that's one step. I go ahead and put sealant. This has an O-ring in it. This is actually the first I've ever seen this O-ring. Even with my 2002 ZR800 cross country, I didn't see that O-ring, which is actually really cool. But um, So I put on the shaft, I put sealant around the, around the base here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put a tiny thin coat right at the edge here of this bearing all the way around. So when I slip it in, it'll seal. And yeah, I know there's an O-ring, but this is a little, little extra. And then I just smear a thin coat around like that. And it doesn't have to be real thick either because it's gonna smush. Just a thin little smear all the way around it. Just like that. And then what you wanna do, because you wanna wipe off the edge all the way around because if you don't get all that sealant off of there your o-ring is going to slip out and you know there's not a lot on there but that little bit will send that o-ring a scooting and that my friends is not what you want you know obviously this is a little extra work but you know what the peace of mind that it creates for me priceless my friends all right so i didn't put the old o-ring back on there because it was kind of flat so we got another one go ahead and put a little blue loctite on here Now, we are ready to put the gear and chain back on, folks. Like I said before, I want to make sure that that space, spacer, I don't know what you'd call that, goes on the inside. And like I said, you want to make sure that you don't have any chipped teeth on your gears or any such thing. All right, so I just went ahead and backed that out. This lock nut did not move, so. Here we go. And like I said before, got this washer. And you wanna make sure, this isn't just any washer, okay? It's not just a flat washer. It's got a convex shape to it and it's kind of like a spring washer okay that's clean and you need to put red loctite on these yes it's a jam nut but This stuff's so much thicker than the blue. Grief. Stuff is like stinking birthday cake writing icing. Go ahead, screw this back in. that 
Both of these nuts get torqued to 36 foot pounds. Um, I like to go ahead and lock the brake again, parking brake. Just pulling that axle all the way in. There it goes. There it is. All right, now the last step for the chain case. Gonna make sure you got all your debris. Off of here. Nice even seal. I'm gonna wipe off this whole ridge. And then before you actually put the cover on, I'm gonna go ahead and hit each one of these holes with some Loctite. Put your case on. Got your six bolts. Two at the bottom, two at the middle, two at the top. And then once you get all the bolts in, you go ahead and torque them in. All right, that is it. All right, so the next step here is to go ahead and put some gear oil in here chain case worst lighting system ever okay, and this does have a dipstick on it. it says add in full so we want to get it right in the sweet spot so what I have here is just some gear oil and there's a lot of debate on what you can put in here these older uh, chain cases like this, you know, outside of the diamond drive, you can pretty much just put whatever type of oil in there. I read an article, well, not an article, it was a thread on arcticchat.com, and this guy put just to, you know, kind of, I don't know about prove everybody wrong or what his whole idea was, but he just wanted to prove to people that it just this chain case just needs lubrication. Doesn't really matter what you put in there. Well, he ended up putting vegetable oil in the chain case and ran it all season. So you just need lubrication. That's really what it comes down to. And this is uh, 75, 140, I think. I'm going to have to move this if I want to be able to get to this. Probably didn't even put a whole bunch in here at this point. Okay. I think it's something like 12 ounces or something in here that you want to put in. You can get all technical and measure it out. That's where they got a dipstick. For dipsticks. <laughs> Only a dipstick needs a dipstick, right? Oh, it's just at the add. So we'll continue to add. One time I got distracted. And I, I can't remember if it was when I was putting, when I got done putting back together my wife's 98ZR. Well, I switched over the chain case from the 96ZR that everything came from. Son of a gun. And I got distracted with a bunch of other stuff. We were getting ready to head up north. Totally forgot to put oil in the chain case and believe it or not got 300 miles out of it 
And then I look back as we're heading back to the trailhead, and she uh, wasn't there. And then uh, so I ended up getting a text from her. And so I call her, and she's like, I'm on the side of the trail a few miles back. And I'm like, well, what the heck happened? She goes, I don't know. It's just making this, like, skipping, grinding, like, noise. It's making this noise coming from, I think it's under the hood. And I was like, what does it sound like? She goes, I don't know. It just it tries to move, but it just won't move. And I was like, what the heck could that, what, could, what is going on? So, sure enough, I went all the way back there and opened it up and was looking around and it's like, well, I can't, you know, it doesn't really seem like anything's, you know, check the, the track and the uh, clutches and stuff and determined that it was coming from the chain case. And I was like, what in the world? So I ended up turning in the chain tension adjuster and it went all the way in. I was like, oh my gosh, what the heck happened? So sure enough, we got, I limped it all the way back. It would, you know, I could get, barely get it going and then it would go and like slip. So the chain was completely slipping over the top gear. So I get it back home and I start to look, I start tearing into it and I pull a chain case off. Not a freaking drop of oil. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. So lesson learned there. Put oil in your chain case. <laughs> so... Le lesson learned, right? Failure's not a failure if a lesson from it's learned. It's really what it comes down to. Stuff comes out real slow. But the thing is, with this thicker stuff, it sticks to everything. I mean, it's real good. It's like motor honey almost. Lucas, if you go into the parts stores, I'm not sure how many have them anymore, but I know that Murray's had it for a long time, and then they went to O'Reilly's, and they had it. And uh, those auto parts, some of those auto parts stores still had the Lucas little display case that was clear and it had gears in it that you could crank with Lucas oil down at the bottom. And it had another one that had conventional oil. And it showed you the difference between the two and how Lucas really like slung up onto the top of the, the gear setup. And the other oils really didn't very well. See where we're at. All right, looks good to me. All right, so once again for the exhaust, this uh, muffler silencer is pretty simple to install. You just have one bolt here, which also has the engine to chassis ground cable. And then you have these two springs that go here. These will have three springs for the manifold to pipe and two for the stinger to muffler. And like I said before, you want to hook the back side first and then put it over the engine side. And what that'll do is ensure that if it does slip off, it goes shooting towards the front of the end, the front of the sled, and not into the belly pan under the engine compartment or under the engine. And you want to make sure that you're not pulling up with both hands because if it pops off, you don't want to pop yourself in the face. You shouldn't be that close to it in the begin in the to begin with, but you're better off using leverage from your thumb or something. All right, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and slap the belt on. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and put the belt on. Um, I found it it's, it's a lot easier if you go ahead and put your parking brake on. And most belts will have a direction, so um, this is a Deco. HPX 5017 and um, 
it's got arrows, so it's pretty self-explanatory. The Arctic cat belts will have triangles, and whichever the point, whichever direction the triangle is pointing, that goes towards the engine. So what I do is just slip it over the primary, just like that. And then, like I said before, I'll get it ready to put on. But the first thing that I do is put it up top like that. And then I push in and twist. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, here's an example of the Arctic Cat belts. So you want that facing the engine. All right. So the next step is to put the skid in. Uh, what I think I'm gonna do is this skid over here, I mean, I wanna kinda clean it off first. I'm not gonna restore it or anything, but these shocks are just toast. It's pretty much just a spring. So I am going to put my wife's ZR skid that I did restore on this, this sled. And then uh, I'll be able to go ahead and put new shock, clean it up, put new, sh get my shocks rebuilt for it. And then uh, put some new bearings in there, some good bearings at least. So there's a couple that are a little dry. You can hear them. That one's fine. The axles are mostly good. One of these other ones. Yeah, there's one. There's another. So I got three on here that need to be replaced because they're dry. And then whenever I, you know, fully restore it, I'll slap a new set on there and put the used ones in the bin. So, all right, we'll bring you back. We're almost done. All right, guys, so I decided to go ahead and take the skid out of my 98 ZR. It's my wife's old sled that she ended up wrecking last year. Um, we're going to go ahead and put this in. That way I don't have to wait to get the shocks rebuilt and, you know, any of the other stuff I wanted to do to the other skids. So um, this one's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and slap this one in there. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and see if I can uh, get a little help from these track hangers again. Get that track up and out of the way. May not even need it with this track still being new like it is. All right, so this skid I've already went through and uh, tightened up a few things. Made sure all the bolts were nice and torqued and um, ended up going ahead and uh, greasing the, all the grease fittings as well. So we're good to go for this season on this skid.
Bucks. Just so you guys know, I hooked it around this axle right here. And you wanna hook it as close to the, you don't wanna hook it right in the middle. You wanna hook it as close as you can to the rail itself because you'll have the least amount of leverage to, to potentially bend this, so. And then I hooked it up around here and onto the back of one of these right here and then just crank it down. All right, now as far as the track tension goes, we'll start at these tensioners here. You wanna make sure that your axle bolts are loose. You wanna get yourself a tape measure. First thing that we'll do is loosen up these. I usually will use my pinky and put as much pressure as I can with my pinky. And that seems to work pretty good for me. Uh, mm, uh, we can leave it like that for a little bit. Let's see. Yeah. All right. And then we'll... Tighten it up. There's not a major craft to it, I mean. This is a new track, so I'll have to tighten it up again after so many miles. I'll have to look and... All right, so that's that side. What you wanna do now, too, is you wanna pick any bolt, any hole, and measure from the front of the outside axle wheel to any bolt here. I'm at 16 and 3 eighths on this bolt here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing on the other side and then tighten them up, lock in both adjuster bolts, lock, tighten up the axle and then go ahead and uh, measure it again. And obviously you want the track off the ground. <laughs> Remember we're going to the same bolt. And one thing to keep in mind too, is this hole right here, you wanna make sure that this isn't an egged out hole. So if you need to go to an actual hole or the, you know, anything that's for sure not out of spec. And we're at 16 and a quarter, so we wanna go another eighth. About a sixteenth more. And you want to go right in the center of this wheel, too. Just a hair more. That's that on there, buddy. All right, and you go ahead and lock it up. Some people like to run them a little looser. 
But you know, this sled has only two actual drive cogs. It's got four cogs total, but the two mi middle ones are the only ones with. All right, to tighten these up, I just will take, I mean, if you got two half inch drives, I technically do, so I could, but you just wanna make sure they're both in the right direction. Put it on either side. Just wanna give it a good crank, make sure it's nice and tight. I've had these come off before. A hook. It was actually this sled. It was the left, or er, yeah, it was that. It was the other side wheel came off. I don't even know how. I thought I cranked them all down. I used Loctite the whole nine yards, lock washers, and it ended up. I don't know, it was probably 70 miles, and then just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we went up, my wife went up over a berm, we were in Frederick, Michigan, and not that far from the Frederick Inn, actually, and um, she stopped after she went over the berm, and she was like, I look back, once I got on the track, like right by the tracks there, she was waving at me, and I was like, come on, come on, hurry up, and I was like, come on, come on forward, and uh so she came forward, she kept looking back. Yep, dead on. And then she gets up close to me, and I hear it going. <laughs> I was like, what the heck's going on? So sure enough, this one popped off. And luckily we found this inside spacer that slips on the inside of that oval in there. And the wheel and the because it had a cap on it. The wheel, the nut, the washer, and this big, the lock washer and the big washer, we never found them. So, that's what happens. But what I did is uh, I had my 9070 XT. I went and took one of the motor mounts. It was a motor mount that had two bolts, 9 sixteenths. Luckily, I had a 9 sixteenths inch, inch wrench inside one of the airbox tool holders. And um, what happened was I pulled one of those bolts out and then got that spacer, put it back on, tightened it down, and we were able to go to um, after hours snowmobile repair shop or after hours repair shop. And it's owned by um, Aaron Blaine. And yeah, him and his him and his guys, they ended up hooking us up. It was the middle of the afternoon. We were going to lunch. And they ended up getting us a, a green bogey wheel or a axle idler wheel. <laughs> so all right guys, that's it. We got this thing on. And uh we could probably go ahead and start it up and you know, let me do a quick measure one more time. Uh, it's about a sixteenth off. So I'm gonna go ahead and loosen this one and then crank this in. It's one ninety. That's about two. That's a little too long. So maybe I should have went one ninety degrees. It looks good. Very nice. Might have to get up under there with a screwdriver or something. All right, so I just pushed that little plug out. And could you imagine if that got, came loose and got caught up in there? Heck no. I'm gonna go. Oh, you don't want. Look what I did want.
There. Okay. All right. And then I'll put some zip ties up on the inside. Should be good. So that's it. That don't look too bad. So I just got to get the flap on there. And uh, that should be just about it, folks. Definitely seems like it's got toe in. So when I measured it, it seemed like it was about a quarter inch and you need to be actually like an eighth inch toe out for best stability. So I don't know what they were trying to do on this sled. There is a bunch of funky things, pretty much like every sled I get. So, all right, guys, that is it for now. We will bring you back. Once again, if you guys aren't subscribed, subscribe to the channel, hit the alert bell, drop in and say hello. You guys have any questions about this stuff, let me know and I will do my best to answer them, okay? Uh, if you guys know anybody else that likes this kind of stuff, please feel free to share with your friends and family on social networking and do yourself a favor and tell yourself what I tell myself all the time. I'm just going to fix it. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you in the next video. Take care and come on back. God bless.